Good afternoon, Frank. Hello, Professor. How are you? Okay. The news hasn't been terribly exciting the last few days, uh, at least not so far as globalization is concerned. I know there are other things which are important that are happening. Yes. But it gave me uh, the uh, time to think about uh, things that I might not otherwise have been thinking about. And um, I wanted to suggest to you that uh, uh, there are a lot of problems in the modern world that derive from um, the way one group thinks about another group. And the reason that groups think about themselves in that way has to do with the way the world used to be when they first got to know each other and they've sort of continued to think that way of each other uh, through into the modern period. And the reason I thought of that was that I'm currently working on uh, my old friends, the Baluch in uh, Pakistan who are threatening to uh, secede from Pakistan, overthrow the Pakistani government and do all sorts of other, um, what shall you say, um, other things that uh, are uh, causing trouble for the government of Pakistan, especially the new government. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, when I look back at the history of these people, um, I can see that they formed their identity at a time when they, they were not part of any nation state and so they had no rights in relation to people who lived in the city. And um, that the whole of the um, arid zone, which is, became the Islamic world from Morocco at one end through to China at the other end, um, was in fact an area in which if you wanted to um, um, produce more um, grow your population, um, increase your agricultural production. You could only do it in a city because you couldn't just go anywhere and um, grow crops. Um, so that um, large-scale agriculture only happened around cities. Mm -hmm. And cities became investment centers. And um, uh, the investment that they were capable of was in fact a trade-off between um, the profits from agriculture and the profits from trade between the cities. Mm -hmm. um, but population growth was often faster than uh, the uh, investment potential of the cities would accommodate. And so there were always people outside the cities who couldn't find a place in the urban economy. Mm -hmm. And that's what produced the tribes of the Islamic world, whether you want to think of, think of the, the Baluch or the Kurds or the Pashtuns or the Berbers or various other groups that aren't quite so well known. Um, so that uh, up until the colonial period, there were no um, bounded territories, no borders, no nation states. Everything was run from cities and the cities only ran the areas that were useful to them. Mm -hmm. and protect, protected the trading caravans that went between the cities. And the people who couldn't find a place in the urban economies lived in the wilderness, um, making the most of what was available to them, but unable to increase production through investment because there was no way that they could come together in large enough numbers to, to develop the, the potential for investment. So they mostly were nomadic, but in some cases they settled on oases and had small-scale agriculture, but they couldn't go any further than that. So they were always sparse. Uh, but they came together every now and then just to cause trouble and exploit opportunities that became available to them, like raiding caravans, or occasionally they would raid cities and they'd overtake a city and create their own empire based on the city. Mm -hmm. So that meant that throughout this period um, of the Islamic, of Islamic civilization, from the 7th century up until the colonial period really got off the ground in the 19th, the cities uh, didn't like the nomads <laughs> and didn't do anything for them either, except when they had to come to terms with them to make sure their caravans could get through to the next city. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when the colonial period came, uh, it, it introduced a completely new idea of territory and it drew boundaries around everybody. And then when the colonial powers withdrew in the uh, middle of the last century, the nomads found themselves in nation states, controlled by the cities. And the cities thought the same of the nomads, they'd always thought of the nomads, and continued 
even though the nomads were now equal citizens with the people in the cities, the people in the cities had the money and they didn't um, extend their investment potential to the parts of the country in which the nomads lived. And so uh, gradually, it took a while, but gradually with the increase in information flows uh, recently, the nomads have come to understand what they're missing and have started to rebel against the governments. So that's how we get the, um, the modern situation of Pashtuns in relation to <laughs> the government of Pakistan. Well, I can, I can tell you're preparing for your paper in Sarajevo. Uh, that, <laughs> no, that actually, was, that's, that, that's next week. <laughs> oh, I mean, that was a very succinct and uh, to the point uh, description of, of a lot of the issues that are going on today, actually, from, from a very deeply uh, based historical perspective. Uh, if, if well, it, 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 what's particularly interesting about it, it is, if people accept it, is that um, we've deceived ourselves about these things up to the present because by calling these people tribes, we've come to think of them as the same as the tribes of the, of the Congo or um, the, uh, what should we say, central, the highlands of Papua New Guinea or uh, the Amazon basin um, because we call them by the same name, they're all tribes. But in fact, the, the uh, tribes in the Islamic world were um, the rejects from the urban population or the people who couldn't find a place in it and, and they were part of a literate civilization and so they always had interaction with people in the cities even though they were excluded from it. Whereas the tribe, people we call tribes in the rest of the world never knew any civilization up until... Well, and, and the Islamic tribes, quote unquote, um, with their literacy that they had then, are now being uh, exponentially bolstered by the access to communications that they have, as you noted, and with the aid of the internet and um, email, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, cable television, uh, cell phones, they do know what they're missing. And, and one of the cases in point is when you mentioned the Kurds. I mean, how quickly the, the Kurds have turned on a dime from not controlling any of their own uh, uh, petrochemical industry under uh, Saddam Hussein to now actually becoming like mini Texas oil men, or I should say big Texas oil men. I mean, they're, they're making a real success of themselves and of the country, and they're, they're very savvy financially, and uh, you know, it's, it's becoming almost a, a small version of, say, Dubai, for example. This is a wonderful example of, uh, it shows that uh, the unevenness in social um, complexity starts the problems. But once there is an opportunity to develop a more complex society, the IQ is the same in all the populations, and it's the social arrangements that make things possible. Um, but we, we, we're so stuck in our own cultural traditions that it takes us a while before we change our minds about people. Mm -hmm. um, Do you foresee, for example, uh, the Chinese are still on track, I believe, to build that big mega port in, in Balochistan, are they not? Yeah, they're, they're still in, in the process of building it, and that's really upsetting the Baluch because they don't see that it's doing them any good at all. Will, will, it, in, will it in fact do them any good, do you think? Well, uh, now, this is, the, this is where my argument moves on to from where I got to a few okay, minutes okay. ago. Uh, the... Uh, um, I mean, it, it looks, what I've said so far makes it appear as though I'm suggesting that this is uh, uh, an argument for the pa pa government of Pakistan to start investing in Balochistan as quickly as possible in order to solve this problem, and that would solve the problem. However, all nation-state governments are having difficulty controlling their territories and um, maintaining the authority that would allow them to do things like this. Um, so I think that, in fact, um, the future of states like Pakistan, even more than some of the more powerful states in other parts of the world, is uncertain. Um, and uh, it, the relationship between what the people in the cities can do and what the people outside the cities can do is changing very fast because if now information is everywhere. And so you can develop situations of social complexity which will allow you to uh, um, generate investment and create, innovate, do all sorts of things that you wouldn't have been able to do before. 
uh, which makes it much more difficult to predict what is going to happen. And I think that the Chinese are going to have a lot of trouble um, maintaining their interests in places like Huawei um, unless they can work out a way to um, satisfy all the people around them and make the people around them feel that they have a part in what's going on. And I think that's going to be a, a, a problem for the Ch Chinese throughout Africa. Um, because they get a very bad press so far for their ability to um, interact. Uh, they, 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 they do, but they, they've been getting good press, for example, with the port they've constructed at the port of Piraeus in Athens. Are they? Are the Chinese working there? Oh, yes. I didn't know that. Yeah, and the, the Greek uh, harbor uh, commercial shipping community has, has fully embraced them because they, they've been afforded positions and uh, economic lifelines by virtue of the, the Chinese investment and the, the maritime infrastructure that they brought in, which the Greek government could not hope to maintain. That's very interesting because um, you know, the, the Chinese government is um, having a more and more difficult time at home. Mm -hmm. And yet one keeps on learning more and more about what they're doing in other parts of the world. And the other piece of news about what the Chinese government is doing in other parts of the world today was in London. Did you hear that? What? That the, uh, the now I'm not sure I can remember the details correctly, but it has to do with uh, English government bank banking uh, having a relationship with the Chinese yuan. Um, did so not that, see that. I, I saw the Chinese government cracking down on GlaxoSmithKline, accusing it of corruption in China. <laughs> no, this is Which separate. Is like the pot calling the kettle black. <laughs> uh, this is uh, this has to do with international currency trading. Okay. And you know that the the Chinese have been extending the international uh, market for the yuan. Mm -hmm. uh, and now they've entered into a special arrangement with uh, banking centers in London for trading in, in the yuan. Really? Um, so, I mean, the, the, the speed and extent to which the Chinese um, activity in new parts of the world is increasing is really quite amazing. Uh, at the same time as they seem to be having more and more trouble managing things in their own country. Well, I, I think uh, that's a very interesting perspective, actually, because it, it has seemed to me for some time now that uh, there's almost like a, uh, a twin, uh, twin-headed kind of monster there. I mean, there's the, the internal policy, uh, outward policy kind of thinking, but then there's the pure uh, mercantilistic financial uh, goal-oriented entity that's there somewhere. I mean, and those people who are operating that are, are pretty savvy business people. So I, I don't know quite how that all fits within the Politburo or the Central Well, Well, the way I see it is that governments as governments are um, becoming less and less um, successful in their operations. But uh, particular entities, which are mostly in the private sector, but some of them are in the public sector, are doing better and better. That is, right. they're much more directed. If, right. If you're part of the public sector and you're delving into the private sector, you have a, a number of enormous built-in advantages. Yeah. Yeah. So that, I, I think that, that, that it's the Chinese, after all, the Chinese government is so enormous that it's difficult to uh, work out how one can talk about the whole government. One's always dealing with some particular part of it, and one wonders how much uh, the president knows about <laughs> uh, everything that's going on. I have to ask you a question, if I may, go back to yeah. Pakistan. I saw this week, the, uh, if I remember correctly, the 400-plus page report that the Pakistani government put out about bin Laden's uh, years in, uh, in Pakistan and how his presence there during all this time was a gross example of incompetence and negligence, etc. I was stunned. I mean, it made for very good reading, but I, I kept trying to make sure I was seeing that the source and the origin of this document was, in fact, the government itself. Yeah. Critic criticizing the military yeah. and the ISI. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what, yeah. what, what's that all about? 
Uh, well, they also criticized the Americans. Oh, yeah, well, they naturally I mean, they threw that in. Just, I mean, it's, it's almost like in the name of uh, all the merciful, the American devil, and then they go on to all this other stuff. And I, I'm afraid I don't have a, a, a detailed knowledge of how the commission that created the report set up and uh, whether they waited for the change of government to release the report. Um, uh, and I mean, the, the relationship between the government and the army has been changing. Uh, so uh, I think there's probably a very complicated background to all this, but it certainly was a very interesting report. Uh, and uh, one wonders what else we're going to hear about it because it was uh, particularly critical of American activity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, as well as being critical of the government. Uh, and after all, it was critical of a government that everybody's critical of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the only problem with it is the, the, the fact that, of course, it included criticism of the army. I was very surprised. I, I, yeah. I, I was very surprised at the, the origin of it. So. It makes it sound as though it may be a, a more democratic country than people give it credit for. I should say so. I mean, I, 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 it, it just struck me as completely out of kilter from, from what you would normally see coming out. I, I kept thinking it was some Amnesty International group or rights group that had put it out, but then it, the, the source was, as you said, it was the commission. But if it was a group of lawyers, it's only what one would expect because the lawyers have been against the government and the army for the last <laughs> half a dozen years or so. Well, they, they may have been, but then to be able to feel empowered enough to, to yeah. raise those types of objections, serious as they are, is, is really quite telling. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, all right. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll reconvene next time. Okay.